Okay, so now once I've shown you how to do the independent samples t test, we're almost there. We have one more step to take. Do you reject the null hypothesis or not? Because if you did, then congrats. That's what you wanted. And you found an effect. But that's not enough. You want to report how big is your effect. So it's one thing to say that you found an effect. But the measures of effect size tell you how big was the effect. So effect size is only computed if you reject the null hypothesis. If you did that, it means that you found an effect, so now you're going to say how big is your effect. This is when you take on this, all right? So, for cos d is super, super simple. You're going to take the mean from the first group, subtract it from the mean in the second group, and you're going to divide that over the pool variance, which we already did before. By plugging the pool variance at the denominator and taking the square root out of that, it's going to give you a value that's going to fall somewhere here. If the d that you find is less than a 0.2, that's considered a small effect size. If the d that you find is somewhere in the 0.2 to the 0.8 range, that's a medium effect size. And if your value here is bigger than 0.8, that's called a large effect size. That's what you want to get published you need at least a 0.8. If you want to get published, you want at least a 0.8. So, it's not enough to reject the null hypothesis. You also want to show that your effect is big enough. Because if it's not big enough, it could have happened by accident. If I want to find the difference in my stats students with my social psych students, and I do find a small minimal difference, but it was only because one student scored far better than the rest and that skewed my data, that's not enough. This is kind of like the bullshit catcher, you know? If you don't have a large enough size, most likely you found something that is not strong enough. So it's like somebody here that's saying bullshit. You didn't find anything. This is one measure of effect size, but there's another one. Now, the proportion of variance. The proportion of variance tells you the percentage that can be attributed to your effect. If specifically I'm interested if I'm interested in knowing if the online format is gonna change the grades of my students and I find an effect, the proportion of variance is telling me this percentage is due to your effect. This percentage of the grades changed because they went to an online format. That's what the number tries to say. This number will never be more than one because the number that you get is pretty much a percentage. So it cannot go over 100%. It can go in a 20%, 50%, 30%, 60%. The bigger, the more reliable is your, your effect. The more worthy it is to take into account. So, you know, if I have a client with the pressure and I think of a new type of treatment to see if it's going to reduce the pressure, and I do find that my treatment indeed is valuable, then I reject the no hypothesis. And the proportion of variance is telling that 70% of the reduction in depression is because of my treatment. Then hell, everybody should try my, my treatment. Because it's not only working, but it works to a large extent. If on the other hand, I find this treatment, I reject the no hypothesis, and I have a proportion of variability of 5%, then 5% of the reduction of depression is due to my treatment is, is not a big deal. So, like, yeah, you find something, but I don't think that we should use it. You know what I mean? The bigger this number, the more reliable is your effect. The bigger is your effect, the, the better it looks. The bigger this number is, the more likely your chances of getting published. So, this one is called eta squared. Eta squared. ETA. Eta squared. And what you have to do is get your T value squared and divided by your square value plus your degrees of freedom, which we previously did, is n minus 1 plus n minus 1. And that's going to give you 1. The second one is called omega squared. So, e squared is 1, omega squared is the other one. It's almost the same. The only difference is minus 1. So, paying a lot of attention to this, you may need to write it down. Omega squared is considered more conservative. 
Conservative meaning like it tries to reduce the possibility of mistakes, the possibility of error. Thus, some journals prefer omega squared. Some journals are fine with e squared. Some journals prefer omega squared. It really depends on where you're trying to publish, whether you want to report one or the other one. And once you're done with that, then you're done. Now you're done for sure. Report it. We need to work on how you report it. So we need to take some time to work to see how you report it. I'm going to put it as a list. You want to remember, state what the interest in the study was. Um, make sure that you provide your descriptive statistics. What is your mean? What is your standard deviation? You can report the distribution if you want, but typically uh, peanut butter and jelly, typically the best ones are standard deviation and means. And then make sure that you report your inferential statistics. You want to report your obtained, t obtained value, your alpha level, was it 0 0.05, was it less than 0 0.05? And overall, then say that you rejected or failed to reject the null hypothesis. And if you rejected, tell me how big is your effect size and tell me how much of the proportion of variability did you have. That, my dear beloved students, is the independent samples t test. Hold on.